We have an incredible staff at First Liberty Institute, and we want to introduce you to one of the newest members of our team. Hi, I'm Peyton Luke, and this is First Liberty Live. One of the things that I love about working at First Liberty is just our top-notch team and the people we get to meet and work with on a daily basis. And today, I have the honor of introducing you to one of the newest members of our team, Justice Andy Gould. So Justice Gould, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Peyton. It's my pleasure to be here. Absolutely. I am so excited about today's conversation because I wanted to let the people know that on top of your extensive legal background, you were also formerly a justice for the Arizona Supreme Court, and I'm excited to talk about that. But before we dive in there, I just want to hear a little bit about your journey, about your education and your legal career before you even got to that point. Well, I went to law school at Northwestern in Chicago, and that was uh, in 1990 when I graduated. I was pretty open to moving to different places. I had some friends who were in Phoenix, and they said it was a great per uh, place for a young lawyer to go. So I went down to Phoenix, and I started practicing for a couple of big law firms down there. I did a lot of big commercial litigation cases, but my, my love was always to be a, a prosecutor. And so after a number of years in private practice, uh, my wife and I went down to the border and I was a border prosecutor in Yuma for a number of years. Um, I prosecuted probably every type of case you could imagine down there, including cartels, had threats made against us by the cartels. It's a very dangerous situation down there. And then after I had, had done that for a number of years, uh, I, I received my first appointment to the trial court bench. And so I was a trial judge for a number of years. I probably did two or three hundred jury trials as a trial judge, and then I was appointed to the Court of Appeals and then eventually to the Arizona Supreme Court. Wow. I, I would love at some point to hear about those stories with the guards. <laughs> um, they, uh, they play hardball. I'm um, sure. I hear people talk about getting the border secure, and, and I agree, but uh, it's going to be very hard. Sure. And now, what made you passionate about the legal field and interested in it from the beginning? Well, you know, it's a couple things. One, uh, I've always loved history, and my, my dad would always share history with us, read history books to us. And when you look at the founders, many of them were lawyers. And when you follow that path, you realize that one of the greatest things about this country is it's a nation built on law, rules. And the most fundamental law is the Constitution. And so the very founding of the country, the bedrock of the rules we all go by is the Constitution and then the laws we passed, obviously, federally and in the state. So it's a country that works on the law and respect for the law. So that drew me to it. I will also say on a more personal note, my, my mother uh, was a legal secretary for many, many years. And uh, I remember going into those law offices when I was a little boy and meeting some of those, those attorneys. And uh, I looked up to them and I, it, it made me want to be that someday. Mm -hmm. And now you were mentioning the Constitution, which is something I wanted to talk with you about as well. And the Constitution protects religious liberty, which is what we do here at First Liberty. So could you just explain to us why that is the cornerstone of our freedom as a whole? Well, after all, it is the First Amendment. So uh, priority, uh, it's, it, it was the most important amendment in terms of getting the states to pass the Constitution. But it's the most fundamental mm -hmm. protection because it protects freedom of conscience, freedom to think. When you look at religious liberty, free exercise, it's the ability of a person to believe and think a certain way and to be protected in the exercise of that. It took literally thousands of years and certainly hundreds of years in Western civilization to get to the point where the government would leave individuals alone, where there was a sphere outside the government where you could think and act and worship the way you wanted to. And so all that background was in place when we adopted our Constitution. All that, the struggles and problems to deal with, you have the government, you have the king, you have the emperor, but there has to be a sphere where people are free from that, where they can think and, and practice and live the way they want. And that's what the First Amendment protects. It, it protects individualism. 
because the way you think, the things you believe in, your faith, is what makes you an individual. It protects people's beliefs about family and, and all those things. So it is that freedom of consciousness, that, that freedom to think and speak in the way that you believe, that is the First Amendment and why it's the most fundamental uh, protection, especially in terms of, of religious liberty. Following your work at the Arizona Supreme Court, you could be doing so many other things right now. You could be lecturing at a university. You could be out fishing and golfing if you wanted to be. So, but you are here now. Why have you decided to come to First Liberty and devote your legal career to defending religious liberty? Well, my whole career has been dedicated to public service. That's the way I was raised. That's what drives me. And so that, that's what drove me to leave private practice to become a prosecutor because I believe in justice. That's what led me to the bench because uh, I could have gone and worked for a lot of firms all those years, but I felt as a judge I could influence the system for the better. And when I got to the end of my, my career on the bench, I, I, I thought, where can I serve now? And the, the verse that comes to mind, it's one of my favorite verses, is Psalm 144.1, where David talks about how the Lord has, has trained his hands for battle and his hands for war. And that's the way I feel. I've been a lawyer for 32 years. I've seen it at every level, small firms, big firms, prosecution, the border, mm -hmm. every court you can serve at. So where could I serve the most? Where could I, where could I take that training the Lord has given me to serve what's most important. Mm -hmm. And it's protecting religious liberty because I've watched in my lifetime the erosion of that protection. And then when I, I thought about where I could serve best, I've watched First Liberty for quite a while. I've seen the work that it's done. Of course, this year has been an incredible year for First Liberty. And in my view, I couldn't think of a better place to work that was more on the forefront of protecting religious liberty than right here. Well, we're so honored to have you. I'll just well, say you. that from the beginning. And so now people on the other side might go, aha, we knew he was a conservative all the time. He was on the Supreme Court. What would you say to those people? Because sometimes just because you're an originalist doesn't just make you an activist, but sometimes, you know, you have to make decisions because it aligns with the law, even as a justice. So what would you say to some of those people? There's two kinds of judges, and I've, I've been a judge or was a judge for over 20 years. There are judges who are going to follow the law, and then there are judges who are going to do what makes them feel good. Mm -hmm. I've never been a judge who's done what makes me feel good. I believe in the law, and sometimes that leads to results that I personally don't like at all. You're not a real judge until you've made a decision that you completely disagree with because the law and the facts led you there. Mm -hmm. So I don't put my personal feelings into a case. I don't write decisions or make decisions based on what makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. I make decisions based on what the law requires of me. And that means I'm a textualist in the sense that I read the words of the Constitution or the statutes or the case law and I follow them. I'm an originalist in the sense that those words have to mean what they meant when they were written, not what I think they mean now. And there's a whole host of guardrails that limit your discretion in, in being a judge. So if someone is, is privately a conservative or a person of faith, that doesn't mean that they can exercise those, belief, those beliefs uh, discretionless when they're a judge. And I never did. So uh, I'm an unapologetic uh, Christian and I'm an unapologetic conservative. Mm -hmm. But I'm also uh, someone who's always followed the law. I never injected my personal feelings in a case, not once. Mm -hmm. And speaking of some of the cases that you've written decisions on, um, at the time we're filming this particular episode, um, there is a case before the Supreme Court called 303 Creative. And you actually wrote an opinion when it was in Phoenix around the time that connected with it called Brush and Nib Studio. So I just want to hear your thoughts on that case and then how it connects to 303 Creative and what it's like seen something that you made a decision on now before the U.S. Supreme Court? Well, I mean, it's, it's obviously very interesting to me. You know, 303 deals with compelled speech. Russia Nib dealt with compelled speech. But compelled speech comes from a case of West Virginia versus Barnett. It's a case during World War II 
Justice Jackson authored the decision. And, and the bottom line is the government cannot compel you to say something that goes against your sincerely held beliefs, be they religious or otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so at bottom in Brush and Nib, there were two young ladies. They had a, uh, a wedding uh, studio where they did custom-made wedding invitations. And there was a city ordinance, the city of Phoenix, which was going to be applied against them to force them to do custom-made wedding invitations for same-sex weddings. Now, these, these, these young ladies had no problem serving any customer, no matter what their gender or, or, or beliefs were uh, in that regard. But in terms of celebrating, using their speech, their art, their poetry, they didn't want to be compelled to celebrate uh, a, a, a wedding that they didn't believe in. So... Um, I struck down, and our court struck down that city ordinance is unconstitutional because it was compelling speech. 303 is the same issue. If you can control what people say, you can control what they think. Mm -hmm. And so the ability to have uh, a doctrine that allows you to resist compelled speech from the government protects thought as well as words. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I want to ask you, what do you think of the Curtis, current status of our country and how the government has been trying to infringe upon people's rights and their speech? I think it's wrong and it's harmful because allowing people a sphere where they can exercise their beliefs, where they can say what they want to say, is a good thing for the country. It makes the country strong. It allows for diversity of thought. It allows for diversity of ideas. That's the great thing about America is that we have all these different viewpoints, all these different faiths, and we discuss and we openly talk about these things. Sometimes we fight and argue about them, but at the end of the day, we build on those things and it makes the country great. But when you suppress that and you require a consensus on all ideas, you stifle innovation, you stifle the things that make this country great. And what troubles me even more is if you look at history, every country that stifles and censors speech, it gets worse and worse and worse. And it leads to a uniformity that we don't want. It's a uniformity of, of the gulag in Russia or worse. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a great threat to freedom, but it's also undercutting, I think, the, the foundational thing that made this country great. Well, I think our audience just heard a bit of why we're so excited to have you on the team now at First Liberty and joining us in the fight for religious liberty. So, Judge Gold, I just so appreciate your time. But is there anything else that you would like to add before I let you go today? It's my pleasure to be here. This is a fine organization, and I look forward for many years to serving First Liberty. And it's just a pleasure to be on today. Thank you, Peyton. Thank you, Justice Gold. After two recent Supreme Court victories, we have the exciting opportunity to go on the offense to protect religious liberty and to protect religious expression in America. We are calling it Restoring Faith in America. If you would like to learn more, you can check out the website rfia.org. First Liberty is your last line of defense and your greatest hope for victory.